<clears throat> thank you for coming, everyone. We'll take some questions from you a little later in the conversation. Um, if you came in here because you saw the word hedgehog and you thought this was going to be about zoology, <laughs> no. I'm sure that happens a lot, though, but we'll find out about what the significance of that word is during the course of my discussion with Lynn Olson, who has, shall we say, owned a part of World War II in her own work, uh, Citizens of London being the one that my book group read and we enjoyed so much, also the book Last Hope Island. So thank you, Lynn, for being here and talking about this really splendid book, which, you know, doesn't have anything to do with hedgehogs except for the name. That's How did right. it become Madame Foucault's Secret War? Uh, first of all, let me say this book is not out yet, unfortunately. <laughs> it's coming out March 5th, um, this, just a few weeks from now. Um, this is a book about the only wo woman to uh, be the leader of a major French resistance network in occupied France during the World War II. Um, I discovered her when I was writing my last book, Last Hope Island. Um, and uh, Last Hope Island is about the occupied countries of Europe and how their leaders fled to England um, to continue fighting on, uh, along with military forces, et cetera. But it's also about, and it's about what Europe, occupied Europe, did to help win the war, which most people don't know much about. Uh, and in writing that book, I wrote a lot about the resistance movements in various countries, uh, particularly France, France being obviously the most important country um, and discovered um, this woman named Marie Madeleine Fourcade uh, and found very little references to her. I mean, I did find them enough to make me intrigued by her, but not enough to really sate my curiosity. Um, and so I decided to, to investigate her. Uh, and uh, what I found was just an extraordinary story. Um, as I said, she is the only woman to lead, it, it was a spy network called Alliance. Um, and she was in her early 30s, we'll talk about mm -hmm. more about her, but she's beautiful, she came from a well-connected family. And the name Hedgehog, I'm finally getting to the question. Um, she, as I said, her network was called Alliance. That was its formal name. But its informal name, given to it by the Gestapo, uh, was Noah's Ark. And the reason for that is that all of her agents, she had more than 3,000 agents throughout the war, uh, throughout, Europe, uh, throughout France, um, she gave them all animal code names. So that's why it became Noah's Ark to the Gestapo. And she, she personally assigned many of the code names. And most of her agents were men. 20% uh, were women, which was the highest percentage of any network in France. But the, she, she would give these grand names to the men, you know, these wonderful... Eagle. Uh, eagle, right. Uh, tiger, lion, elephant, uh, wolf. And to herself, she gave the name Hedgehog. Um, and I Isn't found that... Isn't that typical? I, <laughs> I found it fascinating because, you know, a hedgehog is, is, I mean, they're kind of cute, unthreatening little animals, and especially in, in, in England, they're extremely popular. Um, they are the, uh, they're in children's stories, uh, like, for example, um, Alice in Wonderland hedgehogs are the croquet balls that the Queen of Hearts, I believe. So submissive, yes. Yeah, so submissive, plays. Um, and then in uh, Beatrice Pot Potter, one of her major characters is Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, which is a hedgehog, based on her own pet hedgehog. So, so you know, they're cute little things, um, but... So Oh, uh, no, they, no, I'm sorry. We'll get to, to her naming of her, herself. And then they we'll ha when they are threatened, when they're under threat by an aggressor, they curl up into a ball and their spikes go out. And so they're very hard to defeat, even, even by a lion or a wolf or a tiger. Um, and so I, she thought of herself kind of that way, as kind of outwardly unassuming perhaps, but uh, she, that, sh that she could, she was tough. She was a very tough lady. So here's a woman who occupies a position of some wealth, some, uh, a, f a good family as they say in France, um, who is enlisted to undertake this task, which she herself says, well, I can't do that. 
but give us a sense of what it was like in France at the time as the Germans are invading, first of all, for women who could not vote in France until after the war, and secondly, how France itself was being torn apart internally and made itself vulnerable. What we know about the resistance, we tend to think Casablanca. They're all standing up all the time and singing, singing you know, and embarrassing yeah, the yeah, Nazis because yeah. they're singing the Marseillaise. So lay the groundwork for us of what she was up against and what right. was going on in France, which had a new government every six months. Yeah. Well, I mean, France, like most of Europe, um, was in turmoil in the 1930s uh, as Hitler and Mussolini were coming to power and threatening the rest of Europe. Um, France was, was riven by political and social uh, rivalries and, and hatreds. Um, the governments lasted, as Pat said, for about six months, and then a new government would come in. Um, there was there was uh, there was a lot of, uh, of turmoil on the right and on the left, um, and so it was a, it was a very bad time. And, and again, remember, this is the time of the Great Depression, all not only in the U.S. throughout Europe, um, and um, Fr France is a fractious country anyway. Um, but the Charles, uh, uh, um, excuse me, Charles de Gaulle once said, I don't know how I can rule a country that has 300 different kinds of cheese. <laughs> so there you have <laughs> it. That's have how it fractious it is. In a nutshell, exactly. Uh, but it was particularly fractious in the, in the 30s uh, and early 40s. And then uh, obviously um, uh, Hitler is, is uh, threatening all of Europe, the world, and France and Britain, the two Western allies, basically, you know, um, don't, well, they care, but they're, they're appeasers. They, you know, they don't want to rile Hitler. We know what happens. Uh, you know, Hitler takes advantage of that, uh, invades, uh, takes Czechoslovakia, then Poland in September of 1939. The war begins. Uh, there's the phony war. The French and, and British are not doing anything. Uh, and then all of a sudden in, in 1940, the spring and summer of 1940, the, the sky falls in. I um, mean, Hitler uh, sneak attacks. Uh, Scandinavia, Norway, Denmark takes them. Then in May 1940, launches the Blitzkrieg of Western Europe. And Western Europe has no idea. Uh, it, it, I mean, you know, within weeks, uh, virtually all of Western Europe uh, is defeated and occupied by the Germans, including the French, who supposedly have the biggest army in Europe. Uh, there's no way they can be defeated, right? Uh, well, they are defeated very quickly. And then all of a sudden, the French, to their shock, wake up and discover they are now under German occupation. And the, the shock of it, as you can imagine, uh, was just profound. Um, you know, they had no thought of resistance. I mean, they had, their only thought was survival, basically. Not only that, but unlike any other Western European country um, that had been defeated, their own government was in collaboration with the Germans. You'll remember this, the Casablanca thing, the Vichy water, the Vichy, where he goes, yeah. ooh, Vichy, yeah, you know, right. which was more understood at the time. But Vichy not, was a hero in World War I who... Patan. Uh, with P Patan, Patan, headed by Patan. Marshal Patan was the, uh, the new leader of the French government. He capitulated to the Germans in June 1940, led his government to Vichy. Vichy became the head, the center of the French government, and it was a legal government. Uh, well, De Gaulle went off to London, and he was illegal. He was he was a renegade. Um, it was the legal government of France. So half of the country, the northern half, is occupied by the Germans. The southern half is uh, supposedly controlled by Vichy, but really the Germans are calling the tune um, w with Vichy. I mean, there's this close collaboration. So the, v the Vichy government begins almost immediately uh, persecuting the Jews, uh, for example. To show the Nazis that they were really going to do the that work That they were for basically them. on their side. So let's yes. let's talk about Madame Fourcade, 31 years old, the right. mother of two, still married at the time, although that did not last through the war. Uh, what was the pitch to her? And the obstacles she had as a woman that you described in the book were extraordinary. You have all these men, many of whom had been in the military yeah. before, saying, I'm not going to answer to a woman. Well, she, she had worked, actually, she, she has a fascinating background. She... Um, she was incredibly rebellious. I mean, the, the, the strictures that women lived under in France, she wanted nothing to do with it. Part of it is because she was uh, raised in Shanghai. I mean, so she was outside the normal French milieu. She didn't have the kind of sheltered uh, upbringing that 
most young French women of her background had. And so she, she, right from the beginning, she was very rebellious, very independent. She refused to let anybody tell her what to do. And that, that included her, her first husband, a young French army officer, um, who uh, basically wanted her to be a traditional French wife. And she said, no way am I going to do that. So she has two young children, um, and she leaves him and goes to Paris and uh, becomes part of the social, um, she's in very high society in Paris. Uh, and then, to make a long story short, she meets a, um, a French army officer who is uh, actually kind of a, a peer of de Gaulle's, um, who is very anti-German, um, who is very anti-communist, um, who wants the French high command to start doing something about the army so that they are prepared for another war, which the high command will not do. And he, he's a rebel as well. And so that she hooks up with him, and they start an unofficial anti-German intelligence network. This is before the war. This is in the late 1930s. So she's working with him to collect information about the Germans um, and, and the and the threat they pose um, to, to Europe. Um, so she's already kind of in this intelligence milieu early on. She's, at this point, she's only in her late 20s. Um, and so when the war begins, her mentor um, goes and fights. Um, and then she leaves Paris. Um, and eventually, they get together again. and they decide that they are going to form an, a formal intelligence network, but it's going to be based in Vichy because that's where all the, you know, all, that's where all the information is. So she's his number two. He's the head of this, in, this baby infant intelligence network at a time when almost, as I said, almost nobody was resisting. The, the, the thought would never have occurred. I mean, people were just stunned. They were shocked. They, they couldn't believe what was happening to their country. Um, and, and there were only very, very few people who, who actually were beginning to stand up and saying, no, we aren't going to take this. And the way these two people, this, uh, his name was Georges Lustinal Lacot and Marie Madeleine Foucault, the way they were going to resist was to collect information about the German military presence in France and eventually send it to England. Um, so that's really how it began. And what I found really interesting in, in doing this book is that, in fact, Many of the early resistors, um, again, very rare, were actually in Vichy. Were in the, some of them were in the government in Vichy. I mean, they were supporters of Patan, but they were also anti-German. And I think uh, many people, if they think about Vichy at all, which they don't, but if they do, um, they think of Vichy as being just a, a monolith. You know, it was a col anybody in Vichy was a collaborator. Um, but that wasn't true. No, I mean, you write about people who were inside Vichy who were uh, through the course of the war, were sending information to Marie Madeleine right. because they didn't like what was happening at the beginning exactly. because of the Germans. Realize it was just 20 years after the end of the First World yes, War, that's which had killed proportionally more French soldiers than any other army, except right. maybe the Russian army, I think. And, and so 20 years later, they're being asked to work with the Germans, and a lot of these guys are saying, hell no, and look for an outlet like look for an Marie outlet, right. Foucault to yeah. pass on information. Yeah, no, ex absolutely. And, and that's one thing I really try to get across is that and these are or, a lot of these are ordinary people. Um, we'll talk about as the network uh, progresses, but the people, most of the people in her network, I mean, they're risking their lives every day to find out information about the Germans. They, they weren't trained spies, most of them. I mean, there were some that were military officers who, who actually had been intelligence officers, but most of them weren't. They were fishermen, they were bus drivers, they were truck drivers, they were teachers. Um, housewives. It was, it was, it was, uh, let me say it was very yeah. impressive because when you talk about these people, whenever you read a book about a war, and I read this one, you always ask yourself, what would I do? Yeah. Would I have the guts to do this? We like to think that, well, I'd stand up to the Nazis, but would you really? And when you read Lynn's book, you see how difficult the circumstances were and how much people put themselves at risk in order to pass a little scrap of information about a troop movement, for example. So can you talk about how she, you know, how she operated? She had mm -hmm. radio operators, but, you know, we're used to having phones and sending text messages. What was it like to find and get the information and then send it to the British, who were the ones who ultimately used it? Well, it evolved over the, uh, over the course of the war. First of all, let me say that sh this, this network started in 1940, uh, just a couple of months after the, the fall of France. 
and it lasted. It is, it is one of the very few, I don't know if it's the only, but it's one of the very few that lasted until the end of the war. So she was number two to this guy for, from 1940 to 1941 when he was caught and captured by the Vichy police and turned over to the Germans. And she became head of this, the network uh, in July 1941, 31 years old. Um, and what continued to be the leader throughout the war. So it grew. I mean, it was very small to begin with, and then it, it, it was basically based in Vichy, in, in Vichy, France, in the, in the so-called free zone. Um, but then it expanded throughout France in occupied areas. It had presence everywhere, Normandy, Brittany, um, Paris, uh, you know, Dijon, Lyon. It was everywhere. Um, and it grew, and it grew to finally about 3,000 people altogether. And sh sh this, this young woman uh, was commanding, you know, as I said, thousands of, of, of men. And I was, I tried to find out w how could she do this? I mean, I, you know, it's, it, it, it's hard for a woman to do that to begin with. And she did say, I can't do this, I'm a woman. She was an incredible person by all accounts. I mean, the people I interviewed said that she had this amazing charisma um, that, uh, and a sense of authority that you just didn't question. That when you walked into a room where Marie Madeline was, she was on the only person in the room. And that she just had this, nobody could really explain it, but she, she managed to make these people realize that she knew what she was doing. She, she was in the field with her agents. She was not, you know, you know well, you wouldn't be in pa Paris was actually the, the most dangerous place to be, but wherever she was, she was in the field with her agents. She was on the run from the Gestapo, uh, especially you know in 1942, 1943, the whole time. I mean, she was running from I mean, she was she was running from from place to place. You know, in, in, in about six months, she changed her headquarters eight times, uh, running from one town to another. Um, and, and she was determined that it was going to continue to to live. And and I have never, quite frankly, I have never found a character quite as extraordinary as this as this woman was. I was I mean, going to really ask hard. you about your research because if when you go, you fast forward to the end of the war and then the period with De Gaulle and everybody's praising the resistance, they're being honored. She's virtually obliterated from the record because she was not necessarily a Gaullist. You know, yes, she didn't yeah. pick the right side on the numerous fractions, factions within the French movement. But the suspense, as I read your book, my, at every turn it was <laughs> like, now she's gonna get it, now she's gonna get caught. And indeed people in her group were caught, were killed, were tortured and killed. And, and my God, just to read it is to understand how much one risked by doing anything involved with this. That's, that's absolutely true. And, and I got much of this from her, she wrote a memoir. Um, that was published in French in, in 1968 and was a very bad English translation in 19, the early 1970s. Um, but I read with the help of a, of a wonderful friend, uh, got through the French version, and then we went to Paris and interviewed a number of people, and I did a lot of research elsewhere. Um, it was extraordinary. I mean, it, it reads like a novel. I, her life reads like a novel. Um, it's it, I, I can't do it justice. You'll have to read the book if you want to read the book. Um, it's, I, can't, I picture myself, as, as, as Pat said, I, I couldn't do this. I mean, this woman was in fear of her life practically every single day. I mean, the, the tension, um, she, she chain smoked. She lost a lot of weight. She couldn't sleep. She had nightmares. But yet she kept at it again and again every day. Um, and... She was caught twice um, and managed to escape both times, one of which, I don't know if we're going to talk about that escape or if you want to. Is this to. the one with the papers under the sofa? No, no. Yet, well, it ends in the jail cell where she climbs out. Oh, God, yeah, yeah this one is good. <laughs> it but made me want to lose weight in case the Nazis come back. We'll put it that way. Should I talk about it now? or Just to, a little bit, yeah. yeah just how just, she just very it. briefly. This is when, when my, I'm asked to talk about this book, what more dinner parties and stuff, and my husband, Stan Cloud, who's in the audience, says, you've got to start with a jail escape every time, because she was, she was captured by the Gestapo in uh, July 1944, um, just right after D-Day, and she was in Aix-en-Provence. Um, they 
caught her. They knew she was a spy. They didn't know who she was. Uh, and she was taken to a military barracks jail cell. Um, and she was going to be questioned by the head of the Gestapo in Marseille the next day. She knew that if, when and if he, when he came, that he would discover who she was, and that would be it. She would, she would be pretty much dead. And, and she was afraid that she would not be able to hold out under questioning. Uh, and she thought about taking a, a, um, a cyanide, cyanide pill. pill that she had in her purse. Uh, but That she, really happened. That's not just a no, movie thing. No, it, it, she did have one. Um, and then she thought, well, if, if, if she did that, then she obviously would be dead, and her, her network would die with her. Um, they had just made, the Alliance had just made huge contribution to the d um, success at D-Day. And she, she decided, okay, well, before I kill myself, I'm going to see if there's any possible way I can escape. Um, this was not a, a Gestapo prison. I mean, she would not have been able to get out of a Gestapo prison. It was just an ordinary military barracks, and it was a cell. It was a punishment cell. Um, so it was hot. It was July in Aix-en-Provence. She was sweating like crazy uh, from the heat and also from fear, obviously. Um, and so she went over to the bars of the one window um, in, the, um, in the cell. Um, there, was, there was no glass. It was just bars. And she decided to see if she could possibly, she was a very slender, petite woman, if she could possibly somehow get her body through those bars. And so she tried several of the bars. They were way too narrow. And then one she found that there, it was wider and that there was a possibility. So she climbed on, um, she climbed up and took off all her clothes, put a dress in between her teeth, a very light summer dress, and started working her head through the bar got it through the bar in tremendous pain, got... Thought she'd cut her ears off. She thought process. she'd cut her ears off. She, so she gets halfway out, and then all of a sudden an, an army convoy comes down the road, and she thinks it's the Gestapo who are coming, and here she is naked, you know, pinned like a bug against the, the, the window, and, and so she pulls back and tear, uh, practically tears her ears off again, and it's not, it's just an ordinary army convoy that's gotten lost, so it, it takes off, and so she does it again, and manages to get out, and then jumps to down to the uh, pavement, and uh, a sentry is there, and she didn't know it, and so she flattens herself against the pavement, and he, he says, who's there, and flashes his flashlight, and manages, it goes over her. Um, and so he goes away, she jumps up, puts her dress on, well, first of all, she crawls across the street, jumps up, puts her dress on, and I go on and on, but right. she, she escapes and gets back it's, to Paris. I mean, you're seeing it's this <laughs> movie in your head right now, aren't you? Exactly. It, it, the, the it's book amazing. Is full it's just amazing. Of things like that, and and she she wrote a b later about 1943 as the worst year when so many of her colleagues, right. you know, so many of the spies in her network were caught and killed. And sometimes it seems like the Nazis go back and forth between being easily fooled and being like all seeing and all knowing. Right. And she never knew what she was going to get when they right. had these encounters right. with the Nazis. Right. Yeah, you can just imagine what it would be like. And, and that the, one, the thing about her memoir and other books that I've read that were written by her, uh, some of her top lieutenants, is that constant fear. You, I mean, you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, every day could be the day of your death. And yet they kept doing it. I mean, that's what's so extraordinary to me. Um, they kept reporting on, on submarines, you know, and, and their, their sailing schedules from Brittany and Normandy. They kept reporting on, I mean, this, um, one of her sub-networks uh, was in Normandy, and they happened to be um, living on the, near the beaches that were actually used, the beaches that were landed on by the Allies. And the head of this sub-network was an artist and sculptor. And what he did is that he and his son uh, cycled uh, down those beaches and made notes about all the gun emplacements, all the troop uh, emplacements, you know, the machine gun nests, etc. And he and a number of other people that he were working with him, he drew a 55-foot-long map of the actual beaches uh, that it's we, like la the we landed on. Yeah, it's like the Bayou Tapestry. Yeah, it's like the Bayou Tapestry of D-Day, and. 
it was rolled up, it was a canvas rolled up and sent to London to MI6 in March 1944. Two days later, he was arrested by the Gestapo. Um, so that's, that's the kind of stuff that went on every day. And, and yet they, and they did it. They kept doing it, knowing that, that, that the possibility was great, especially in 1943, um, that, that, the, that the Germans were going to find them. And, um, but it didn't stop them. It was, I mean, I'm getting choked up thinking about it because these people, they knew their lives were at risk. And in some cases, they did lose their lives. But every little piece they contributed, this, this map was a massive piece, but every little bit came together in the tapestry of the Allies' strategy in the war. That's right. And the Nazis, in many cases, could not figure out where this intelligence was coming from. Right, exactly. exactly. And especially not crediting a woman for being at the top. So maybe if you want to talk about the resistance, uh, not the capital R resistance, but the reaction to her being a woman, you know, in England where they knew that Hedgehog yeah. was in charge of this operation but didn't necessarily know for good reason who Hedgehog was. And how difficult that was in just dealing with the individual members, one of whom committed a terrible betrayal of his right. colleagues. Um, sh no, she, did, she wanted to keep the British as unaware of the fact that she was a woman for as long as she could. Um, when, when her mentor was captured by, the, by, the, by Vichy, um, she, sent it, she worked with MI6. She worked with mili uh, British intelligence. Um, and when he was captured, uh, she sent a radio message to the British, to MI6, and said he had been captured. And they sent back immediately, well, who's taking over? And her, her code name was uh, POZ, P-O-Z, 55. And she said, I am P-O-Z, 55. But she never, ever told them who she was. Until finally, a few months later, um, her network suffered the first of its collapses. It suffered several collapses, but this was the first. She was basically all, all, all on her own, and she finally realized that she had to admit to the British that she was, uh, to identify who she was um, and to get their help. So she, to do that, she's in Vichy, France now. Um, she goes across the border between France and Spain. Spain, of course, is neutral. Uh, and, and that's where she was going to meet um, a British uh, representative from MI6. Uh, but she had no papers. Um, and the only way she could get across, the way she got across, was um, she was hidden in a diplomatic mailbag. And, um, for nine hours. For, and and it's, it's a very long story, but by one of her, her top lieutenants. Um, and he drove a car that was put on a train that made the crossing, this was in the midwinter, uh, that was the only way they could get across, uh, a train that went from France into Spain. So he is, he's a diplomat, supposedly, a, a Vichy diplomat. He's not really, he's a member of her network, but he puts her in this mail bag and cuts holes in it and thinks she's only gonna be in there for a couple of hours and, turn, and as Pat said, it turns out she's in there for nine hours and, and practically, freezes to death, but sh that's how she gets into um, to Spain, and then when the MI6 finds out, they are, to put it mildly, blown away by the fact she's a woman. They're not thrilled because MI6 has the same attitude toward women as the French do, and uh, you know, in other words, they don't want anything to do with them in, in positions of leadership. Um, but by that time, her, her network was so established and they had done so much really good intelligence work for the British that there was nothing the British could do. I mean, you know, they, they couldn't get rid of her and they couldn't, certainly couldn't get rid of her network. So she was, from then on, she was accepted um, by the British because she had already proven herself um, under her code name of POZ, um, P-O-Z, as I said that. I, I mentioned earlier that you know, you were surprised to find this woman, mm -hmm. and I'm surprised to read about her that she's so unknown. But there were a couple of reasons. One was, as I cited earlier, if you weren't a Gaullist resistance person, right. you were kind of wiped from the record. Right. Because there were factions that thought de Gaulle was not the ideal leader, and he was in England. And the other is that her own memoir was not very honest about her work. No, no. Uh, her, that, that's absolutely true. Um, one thing I found out in doing this book, um, was that how you were remembered, if you were a member of the resistance or if you were involved in, in the war at all in France, how you were remembered to, some, to a great extent was um, how the Gaullists and how the communists thought 
thought of you, what they thought of you. Because the, Charles de Gaulle and his people basically set the tone for the resistance after the war. They were the ones that really wrote the history of the resistance, or the early history of the resistance. So that anybody who had been involved in Vichy at all was basically uh, an, wiped out of the, of Even the record. Even if they used Vichy in a good way. Even if they used Vichy, in, but nobody connected with Vichy could possibly have been important in the resistance, which was not true. Um, but it, it, it really, the early histories of, of uh, the French resistance, uh, that's very, very, very much true. The, the, the Gaullists, Charles de Gaulle basically uh, you know, decided who was in the resistance and who was important and who had done a good job and not. And then the French communists were very, very important in the resistance and then they also were incredibly important in post-war French politics. Um, so they also had um, you know, a, a role in that. And um, they also didn't like you know, anybody involved in Vichy, but they also li didn't like anybody who was anti-communist. And um, Alliance Network was anti-communist. So for all these reasons, um, she was written out. But she was also written out because she's a woman. Um, you know, this, this is incredible. De Gaulle, after the war, set up this, this, this organization of, of, of resistance heroes. Um, and he, they, he, he and his men chose over a little over a thousand people to be in this. I think it was 1,062. And of those 1,062, 1,056 were men. Six women were chosen. And, and Marie, she was not Marie Madeline was not. Um, so this, so even today, uh, th there is now acknowledgement that women did play a, a big role in the resistance. But even today, uh, she does not get her, her cre the credit she deserves as being um, the head of the largest and most effective allied intelligence network in France during she, the war. She gave a lot of credit in her memoir to other people. She did, And yes. she also left out personal details about herself, which we yes. won't ruin the story, but why would she not be forthcoming about those? Um, well, she, she was a very private person. Just, I'll just, I won't go into detail, but when you read her memoir, you know, you, you just sense that she is very, very much in love with the man who was her second in command, who was this dashing former Air Force pilot, um, charismatic, passionate, just like she. And you, ju you just sense that there was something more there, just the way she writes about him. She's, she's, she's just, she's passionate about him, but, but without saying, being very private. Uh, or trying to be private, um, and I, f we found out after um, that she, and they, in fact, were having an affair. But she, she was, she tried to be a very private person. She did not go into a great amount of detail about her own personal life in her memoir, and that served to her disadvantage because everybody else is out there bragging what they did for the resistance. Right? Yeah, well, well, she, she was pretty honest about what she did for the resistance. I mean, uh, sh she, but, but she gave a lot of credit to the people that she worked with. I mean, that's th her focus was really on the people uh, who were in her network. Just like a woman. Just like a woman. <laughs> but, the, but the fact is that, you know, she, I don't care, woman or man, this, this person was one of the most extraordinary figures that I think I've ever run across in all my writing. She got the honor she deserved, posthumously. Posthumously, she did, yeah. She, she was given a, a very uh, elaborate uh, funeral in Paris. Uh, she was. Um, buried from Les Invalides, which is the, you know, this... Napoleon is there. Napoleon is buried there, and, and she isn't buried there, but her funeral was, was there, and the first time a woman had been given that honor. Um, so she was given some credit, but, but to, to this day, people in France really don't know who she is, and certainly in, in this country, they don't know who she Are is. Are they translating your book into French? That'll show them. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. We don't know yet. It's, it is a, a book that it really does leave you gasping, and you were invested in these figures because of their heroism, their humility, and to find out what happens to them if they escape, if they don't escape. It really does, as I said early on, it gives you the metric by which you judge yourself. If things were that dire, what would I do for my country? What would I do for my family? What would I do for the principles and what I stand for? So uh, I think it's a remarkable book. Well, and it, it's, um, I hope it's going to be a major motion picture because it tells a story that I think has been glossed over in many aspects in what we know of the resistance in France. So if you have any questions in the audience, I need you to stand up. I'll point you out, and then you'll repeat them. Let's go right here first. Uh, 
Okay, that's Good in the question. book. What, what happened to her children? Because she had two children at the start of the war. And she had two more later, and I'm not going to spoil the story about the two later, because one of them is a, kind of a poignant story in itself, but I'm not going to... The two children um, that she had before the war, they're obviously by her first husband. She had been estranged from her first husband since the early 1930s. Um, she saw them almost... They, she saw them occasionally. Um, her, her mother uh, and other relatives ca cared for them. Um, they were, her, her son was, I think, nine when the war began, and her daughter was six or five. Um, and uh, she would occasionally see them, but all, you know, uh, very, very brief moments, so, uh, because she, she was so afraid that they were gonna get captured. And in fact, um, in 1943, um, when they were really on her trail, the Gestapo were really on her trail, um, she found out that they were, that, that the Germans were about to seize them as hostages, the, the children. And so she managed to arrange to get them smuggled out of France uh, to Switzerland. Um, and, but she couldn't see them before they left because she was so afraid that the Gestapo would capture both her and the children, so she arranged for her assistant to walk the kids by the apartment building that she was staying, hiding in, um, so she could see them through the window for one last time before <sighs> they left. And then they did, were smuggled out. She found out after the war that um, right before they got to the Swiss border, uh, whoever was guiding them uh, got cold feet. The, the border was really heavily guarded uh, with barbed wire, et cetera and told the children that they had to go on their own. And her son, who by that time was 11, I think, um, managed to get his little sister and him through the, yeah. the barbed wire, and they Amazing. did make it to Switzerland. They so. survived, and, and they were reunited in um, uh, right after Paris was liberated. Let's get so. to another question here. Very quickly, please. Yes. Well, first of all, uh, your research is incredible. Your anecdotes and private conversations. How do you get them? And with regard to the resistance, when you have 3,000 members in a war-torn country, how do you vet them so that you don't get the spies against Oh, them? okay. Let Both me repeat those. the question. Okay. The, one of them was about her research, about these very intimate anecdotes, which are very vivid and very telling. And the other is when you have 3,000 people in your resistance network, how you vet people to make sure you don't get spies, double agents within them. Uh, it, it varies according to book. But with this book, I was helped a great deal by her memoir. And the memoirs of two of her um, top people, um, one of them ended up in a Gestapo, Gestapo prisons for 17 months. And it, it, both all of these books were just filled with those kinds of stories. And then when, when um, my friend and I went to Paris and we interviewed her daughter and the children of several of, of the others, then they provided them. Um, but it really d differs according to um, the book that I'm writing. The, the second question is, is a great question. And, and that was a, a problem that bedeviled all or networks uh, in the resistance. You know, how you can't vet them. I mean, um, you, you do your best. But when a, when a resistance organization grows that fast, it's almost impossible to vet them, and it's almost impossible to prevent traitors uh, from becoming part of that organization. And, and, she, and she said after the war, she said, a, a resistance network is only, only really good if you have one person. You know, if you add two, then, it, then the, the, uh, the danger increases. And when it goes to 3,000, it's almost, it is impossible. Um, to prevent and it did traitors, happen. and it did happen. It did happen several times. So. Another question was here. No, you've all disappeared. Um, as you did your research, were you gasping the way I was when I was reading? Like, yes. oh my god, oh my god, yeah. and there's this. Yeah, uh, I mean, I <laughs> would talk to my husband. Uh, the same thing. I would say to him, you, you, you will not believe this, and you will not believe that. Um, it. It, it really, it, it just seemed like it couldn't possibly happen. But uh, I was able to to check uh, much of you know what she wrote uh, through um, official sources, etc. 
And as far as I can tell, virtually, it, you know, everything she wrote was correct. It, it's just, and I think the stories are out there. I mean, she's not alone, uh, but she just happened to write this, this amazing book in which she was able to, what I like about this book is that I think it, hopefully it gives a day-to-day a -day picture of what it was like to work in a, an organization like this. Um, and and l let me also add, and I haven't, we've talked about the danger, we've talked about the fear, we've talked about the terror, but we haven't talked about the great joy these people had in working together. They were a family, and she treated them like a family. She thought of them as her family from the first day until the end of her life. She spent much of, um, after the war, she devoted it, almost all of her life to helping um, the families of those who were killed uh, in her network and also the people, and she stayed incredibly close to um, members of her network. I mean, uh, um, Noah's Ark was her whole life. It really was, and it continued until the rest of her life. And she, but she talked about how much she loved these people, and it was, it was true love. I mean, you know, they, 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 I, they were not expendable and disposable. They were not her. expendable and disposable, and she was grief-stricken throughout the war because, because so many of them were captured and killed, uh, so many of her closest friends. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, you don't wonder that she couldn't sleep when yeah. she was waiting for news right. of this or that agent. Right. And the other thing that struck me, and, and then we'll be wrapping up here, is there was a tipping point in the war in France and how people regarded it because up until that point, you know, the Nazis had more or less let people go about their business, and it was when they started conscript conscripting every able-bodied French person into what was essentially slave labor right. that the French said, oh, no, no, this yeah. won't. And her, yeah. her network and her sources expanded exponentially. Th that right. really galvanized the French to say, that was one period, this is another, we're right. not putting up right. with them shipping our sons and daughters to Germany right. to no, that's do who knows right. what. That's absolutely right. And, and that's when the resistance became much more of a force in France. But before that time, you, know, you really did have only uh, a relatively few number of people who were actually risking their lives every day. So when people s joke about the French resistance, they don't know these stories. No, they don't no. know these uh, details. I mean, the French resistance, uh, de Gaulle said the French resistance, the, the, the French liberated their own country, which is, which is absolutely nonsense. You know, uh, it was it was like the, so much of what he right. said. Right, <laughs> it, it was the Allied forces that liberated France, but they did play a substantial role in, in intelligence, particularly what Marie Mallon was doing in intelligence, and they did went after D-Day uh, in terms of sabotage and all that. But what they did, which is um, as important, is they saved the soul and honor of France um, by standing up against the Germans. They were not going to allow that shame of capitulation to last. And, and they basically saved their country, I think, morally. What happened to that five-foot map of the Normandy beaches? Yeah, I don't know. I, I have not been able to find it. MI6 is still very secret. Uh, it, it has kept its secrets. You can't get information from them. And, and so far, I, I don't this know This was where a map is. that somebody wrapped around his body Right. No, the 55-foot map was put into it. There, there were two maps in the, in the okay. book. That was another Different map. That was another map. So yeah. this one, nobody knows no, what nobody knows where it is. So. Yeah. so there's still mysteries. And it's there's funny because you think of the distant wars seem mysterious because we don't have much in the way of written records. The Civil War more so. World War I, we have film. World War II, we've got everything yeah. but text messages. And yet there's still mysteries, oh, th 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 still th th untold yeah. stories, which must be what fascinates that's, that's you. That's exactly right. Um, that's why I keep writing about World War II, is I, in doing research, I uncover more and more really interesting things that nobody knows about. All right, Stan, you've got to be ready for the next book then. So, <laughs> there's a, Do we have time for one more question? That uh, just very quickly. Yeah, no because statements, we're, we're just about questions, out of time. please. Novel I, I, the Nightingale. Yeah, I, I think it was based on uh, a number of people, uh, women in the French resistance. That that really is, uh, I think she's an escape. She's a, she's helping uh, Allied uh, servicemen to escape from France, and that was another strand of the resistance that I haven't talked about. And I'm talking now about intelligence, but um, I, I think it was a composite of different people. Won't you please thank Lynn Olson? Thank you. Thanks very much.